Hey everybody, tonight we're going to be doing lesson 6-4, make more comparative inferences about the population. We're going to start with the Explorer, where it says Jackson and Brother Levi watched Jewel Geyser erupt one afternoon. They record their time intervals between eruptions, the dot plot shows their data. Jackson estimates that the average time between eruptions is 8 minutes. Levi estimates that the average time between eruptions is 8.5 minutes. Well, first they want us to construct an argument to support Jackson's position. By looking at this, I think he went by the median. Remember, the median means the information that is dead center of all the data. So to do this, I'm simply going to go ahead and cross off one side at a time. And I think I grabbed the wrong thing here. There we go. And I'd cross off one at a time. So let's just take two at a time to make it a little quicker. Look at that. We realize dead center is going to be at eight. So that tells me, in support of Jackson's argument, eight minutes is the median of the data. That is half of the time the geyser erupts every eight minutes or less, and the other half of the time the geyser erupts every eight minutes or more. Now they want us to construct an argument to support Levi's position. And he says it's eight and a half minutes. And I would think that it might be the average, but I don't think so by looking at this. I think they went by the mode. And the mode is something we're going to learn today. Is it's the most often da uh, used data that we see. So the thing that we see that happens the most often in the data is it being eight and a half. So I would say that's going to be the mode. And it says in support of Levi's argument, 8.5 minutes is the mode. So it occurs most often. This means the geyser is more, most likely to erupt again after 8.5 minutes. How can you best describe uh, the best measure of center to describe a set of data? How can you best describe the best measure of center to describe a set of data? Well, um, first of all, let's look at the means in this particular set of data here, okay? And the means would be taking the average of all, all of this, so that would be one plus, well, two uh, times two would be four, so four plus one is five, and then adding three, uh, five would be six, seven, eight, and adding four, uh, four, uh, let's see, that's, uh, let's see, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, and add five, that's 17, and uh, 17 plus eight would be 25. Then we would divide it by the number of dots, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 25 divided by seven will give us 3.574. When we round that up, it's going to be about 3.6. Now let's look at the median. The median is the, the information. It's in the middle. If I slash off this end, then this end, this end, then this end, this one, and then this one, we see that three is the median for this data. And last would be the mode. The one that's most often seen is two. So the mode would be two. Now that's great for data that's all set together pretty tight. But what happens if we had combines all that data with something we call an outlier. An outlier is something that is way out of the spectrum of what we're witnessing, something that is out of the ordinary. If we were talking about who makes uh, uh, 15 or uh, the best of 15 free throws and everyone in your team shot, let's say there were eight people in your team, um, one guy only made it one time, two people made it uh, two times, uh, one person made it three times, one person made it four, one person made it five, one person made it eight shots, but one guy was spectacular and made it all 15 times. He's the outlier. He's not the norm. So if we were to put this data with this, let's see what happens. Well, the means all of a sudden is going to turn into 40 because we're going to take the average of these numbers, which would be 40, and then divide it by eight because there's eight uh, components in there, and it's going to be five. And now instead of it being uh, three point uh, I believe it was six or something. We're looking at five, which is a big difference. And then the median uh, is going to be 3.5. Uh, why? Because now we're going in the middle, and the middle is of eight data is going to be three and four, and the average of three and four would be three and a half, right? We cross out the ends one at a time, 
and that's going to go ahead and put us at three and four. So three and a half would be the means. And the mode would stay the same because it's still the most often thing. Uh, so we have to look at this data and think with the outlier, it's very deceiving. So when you're talking about the, uh, how to best describe data, uh, the means is the average of all of the values of the data set, but the means is affected by outliers. So when the data set has outliers, the median better describes the center because the median was 3.5 uh, in this one and only three in the other. So that means we were only off by about 0.5. We stayed really closer to the truth there. <clears throat> Next, uh, we got Quinn collects data from a random sample of 27th grade students who participate in youth fitness program. She compares the number of curl ups each student completed in 30 seconds last year and this year. What can Quinn infer from her comparison of the data? Well, if we look at all this data, wow, that is a lot of data. First thing we're going to want to do is put it on order from the smallest number to the biggest number. So we're going to display the two sets of data on a dot plot. And if we do, we'll see uh, that the curl ups that were done last year, there was one of them, that, uh, one person did 20, two people did 21, and so on. Uh, and this year, we see that uh, one person did 21, one person did 22, one person did 23, and then so on. What can we do with this data? Well, <clears throat> we can use the dot plots to compare the two data sets. If I'm going to compare these two data sets, first thing I'm going to do is realize that uh, the mode is 24 in the first year, but it's 28 in the second year. Uh, the range is seven. Remember, it's the biggest number minus the smallest number, and that's 27 minus 20, not seven. But over here, it's 30 minus 21, so that's nine. There is a bigger range here in this uh, second year. So uh, the number of curl ups completed this year is generally greater than the number of curl ups uh, from last year. But based on the shape of data, not all of the students made the same progress. Look, we got uh, some students still only made about 21. Uh, so we have a bigger range here, uh, a variation for the number of uh, curl ups that were done by students. Quinn can infer that most of her classmates were able to do more curl ups this year. Now, Quinn also collected data about push ups. Does it appear that the students generally did more push ups last year than this year? Well, we're just going to explain our reasoning here. <clears throat> Well, based on the data, students generally did more push-ups this year than last year. There are more dots uh, for greater numbers of push-ups completed this year. As we can see, more dots are on the far side, our right side of the spectrum here. So that's why we can say that students generally did more push-ups this year than they did last year. Sample uh, example two, Quinn computes uh, the means and the mean absolute deviation, which we'll call MAD, for each data set. How do, you, how do these measures support Quinn's inference from the data display? Well, it says here the curl ups completed last year, uh, the means, in other words, the average was 23.6. But over here, the means was uh, 26.6. Uh, the MAD, which they call the uh, mean absolute deviation for the first year was 1.4. The second year is 2.1. Well, the means number of curl ups completed this year is greater than the means curl number of curl ups completed from last year. This supports Quinn's uh, inference. Now, some of you are wondering what, how the heck did they get this uh, mean absolute deviation? I'm going to go over it one time because it's really not important for you to learn this year. It's very complicated. We're finding the average of the difference. When I say average of the differences, I mean that, uh, well, let's just take, for example, year number one. We have to take the difference of the means. We find the means is 36.6. So we're going to have to subtract every one of these numbers from that. Well, 26 or 23.6 minus 20 would give us 3.6. And since there's only one of them, I'll multiply that to one. That'll give us 3.6. Uh, over here, we've got two of them that are 21. So when we take 23.6 and minus 21, that gives us 2.6. And we multiply that by two because there's two of them. 
that gives us 5.2. We're going to do the same thing throughout this whole data set and finding the difference, right? The total difference. And then we're going to add them together and divide them by the number of dots there are. And there's 20 of these dots. So that means I'd have to divide it by 20, which would give me 1.44. And we're going to round that up to the nearest tenth, which would make it 1.4. And that's how we got that. And now that we know that, <clears throat> The mean absolute deviation is greater for the number of probes completed this year. This suggests that not all students made the same progress. Again, look how close the data uh, variation is spread out uh, to where it was in the first year. That means some kids might not have made any gains at all. But uh, for the most part, we can say that uh, many of them did better or much, many of them did better this year than they did last year. Example number three. Graffy, one of Quinn's classmates, reported the number of curl ups he completed this year and last year. He did not tell Quinn which number is for which year. But based on the data that Quinn gathered, which number most likely represents the curl ups he completed last year? Well, we can see that he's saying that it was either 19 or 23. And since we know that more kids did better on the second year, we can say that the 19 push-up or curl-ups were probably from last year. Based on the data that Quinn gathered, she inferred that most students could complete more curl-ups this year than last year. So Rafi most likely completed 19 curl-ups last year and 23 curl-ups this year. In our trial, it says Peter surveyed a random sample of adults and a random sample of teenagers about the number of hours that they exercise in a typical week. He recorded the data in the table. What comparative inferences can Peter make from the data sets? Remember, inference is just information that you feel you can pull from it. Well, if I'm looking at this, adults, uh, the average of adults worked out about 4.4 hours in a week. And uh, the average for teenagers was 7.9. Well, I mean, 7.9 is really close to 8. That's almost twice as much as the adults did. So I guess I can say that according to the data, well, on the average, teenagers exercise nearly twice as much as adults. All right, our key concepts are that you can use data plots to make informal comparative inferences about two population. You can compare the shapes of the data display or the measures of center and variability. The modes are 15 and 16 and the range is 10. Mode, remember, is the most often used, and the range is the biggest number minus the small number, smallest number. So that would be 20 minus 10 would equal 10. In this case, the modes are 18 and 19. Again, the most often seen are the most dots high. And the range is 11. 25 minus 14 is 11. The modes of the data set B are greater than the modes for data set A. The means of data set B are, is greater than the means of data set A. You can infer that data points are generally greater in data set B. The range and the MAD, uh, remember measure of absolute deviation, uh, of the data sets are familiar. You can infer that the variabilities of the two data sets are about the same. Ready to go to the do you understand? How can dot plots and statistic measures be used to compare populations? Well, dot plots show the shape of the data sets and can help you see measures of center, such as means and median, and spread, such as range. Dot plots and other data displays can be used to visually compare data. Measures of center and variability can be used to quantitatively compare data sets. How can you make predictions using data from samples from two populations? Well, you can use the data from random samples of two populations to compare measures of center and variability. This can help you make inferences about each population that you can then use to make predictions. Lastly, two data sets have the same means, but one set has a much larger measure of absolute deviation. 
than the other. Explain why you may want to use the median to compare the data sets rather than the means. Remember we talked about the data from the sets with the larger measure of absolute deviation has greater variability than the data set with the smaller MAD because of the variation. The median may represent the data better. Remember we had that example where we had that big outlier and the more spread that the data is, the more uncertain we are of just how, uh, I guess, what the median, what the middle range is going to be that would properly represent that. So uh, sometimes finding the median is better than using the means. Now we see uh, for four and five, we're gonna use the information below. Coach Fiske records the number of shots on goal his first line hockey players made during two weeks on hockey scrimmage. You can see the information is sit here for week one and week two, and it shows the, the days as they went by. Find the mean number of shots on goal for each week. Well, in week one, if we count this up, we've got uh, seven and three is 10, uh, eight and two is 10, so that's 20, six and four is 10, that's 30, and then five would be five, 35 divided by, well, there's uh, seven days, so divided by seven, that's gonna give us an average of five. Uh, the means would be five for this first week. And the second one here, when I count these up, oh, I've got seven and eight, which is 15. Uh, five and five is 10, so, uh, 10 plus 15 is 25, plus nine would be 34. Uh, 34 plus eight would be uh, 42, and 42 plus seven is 49. 49 divided by seven is seven. So I would say that the means for week one is five, and the means for week seven is seven or a week for week two is seven, excuse me. Uh, number 5A says based on the mean for each week, in which week did his first line take more shots at goals? Well, based on this, I would have to say that week two, uh, they took a lot more shots. And based on the comparison of the means and the range for week one and week two, what could the coach infer? Uh, well, the team is improving and playing more consistently because the mean increased and the range decreased. Well, we can see that the mean increased. What does it mean by the range decreased? Let's look over here. We see that the, uh, on day four, they made eight, but on day five, they made two. Remember, it's the biggest number minus the smallest number out of all the data. And that eight minus two makes a six. So that is gonna be a range of six for week one. But look at week two the highest number was nine and the lowest was five. Nine minus four or five is four. And that means in week two, the range was only four. That means the range has de decreased and they're getting better and better. Well, it looks like the rest of the homework for you guys. So uh, good luck and I'll see you in the next lesson.